looking at at data and is it is it difficult to f find it or to make sure that what works say in a bull market works in a bear market you know that's one of the benefits of having you know we've been doing this since 2006 so we have this history you know this mm -hmm. backlog of history which is extremely valuable so we can go back and back test um uh yeah it's 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 a valuable exercise to go through you know if you go back to 08 or or during COVID times, what happened to your 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 data set? And that's a big part of what we do when we talk to the buy side potential customers is this this idea that you back test and you want to make sure you understand your data well enough that you know the holes, you know where where it's strong, where it's weak. Um, but that that's a, an essential part of this uh, entire process for sure. Mm -hmm. Well. Every quant group I've ever worked with, we've had at least one really smart quant who is like, hey, look what I found. If you split up all these regimes, um, you can figure out, you know, basically when to lever up, down, turn signals off, on, and you can. Um, but it uh, turns out to be really tricky to know today what regime you're in. Um, and so everything I've seen is like, you know, yes, that's true. There are obviously market conditions that will shape what kind of signals are efficacious, but it's very difficult to now cast and know where you really are. And when you really dig into this regime switching idea, very often the returns you'll find in a back test are generated across a couple of very specific isolated outlier days or events. And if you are not perfect on catching those, you lose the whole apparent benefit of having been able to regime switch or regime time. So um, have been in, and, and I'm sure folks will hopefully come up to me over lunch or cocktails and debate me on this because there are a lot of passionate um, regime modelers out there, I think. Um, and it does look very attractive, but I've never personally seen um, it work all that well in practice. The common theme today has been around, everyone's talking the generative AI game, right? But every, but it all comes back to effective data governance, right? So before, um, I, I founded Spatial Risk Systems. I ran reference data back set, right, for, and data governance. And so, we're, you know, we're in the middle of this big data connectivity arms race. Whoever connects and standardizes the most content and exploits that connectivity is going to win. So I think when you, when you go back, you know, to, you know, back to your organizations, right, how well are they organizing things at enterprise level? If they're not, you're going to struggle to kind of build great AI models out of your internal and external data sources. So I want to go back to a point that John made um, about the bear versus bull and about um, the kinds of questions that are asked in these different markets. So ultimately, that's what it comes down to for us is, for instance, um, during COVID, the big question was what's going on with the commodity supply chain? Um, what's happening here? That's where all eyes wanted to be. So that was the most request that we got as far as a geospatial data provider. Like, please, can we understand what's happening, for instance, in the Suez Canal during that blockage? Can we understand like where our products are since you know, people are waiting nine months to get a couch, things like that. Um, so in these unique circumstances, I know COVID was ultra unique, um, but ultimately market demands affect us in a way that folks are interested in different um, aspects of what might be happening and therefore come to us with different questions. Right. So the supply chain resiliency, right? So when Hurricane Adelia hit Florida earlier this year, all right, 23 counties declared a disaster. So we were able to determine all the power plants in those counties and say that 21% of Florida's electricity was coming out of those counties. So as real-time weather and political events hit, if you understand where the physical assets are, you could start to basically bet on that a little bit and basically how our supply chains could potentially be impacted by real-time events. And that's another thing you could do with physical assets that, that you really can't do with the current reporting that's in place today. Right. Um, and since you mentioned COVID, I uh, just wanted to, to follow up on that. Um, you know, it seemed like COVID, for, because of the supply chain disruptions and, and, and just the, the general disruption we saw, it seemed like it was something that maybe put alternative data a little bit more in the, uh, in the spotlight. Uh, I'm just wondering how you all think um, it, it did transform the the adop, adoption of alternative data and the industry you know, in the years since. Yeah, I can hop in. Um, I think before COVID, there might have been more hesitation to use satellite data, to use um, just overall more broadly. Like I said, the big move that I'm seeing is a move from um, satellite data, RF, et cetera, in the government space 
into the commercial space. I think COVID really accelerated that um, just because folks aren't able to get to um, the sites where they need to, you know, perform their observations, perform their surveys. They can do that from space. I think that was really key. Um, and I think that's been the big change. And I think that change is here to stay. Um, so I think before COVID, folks were a little bit more hesitant. Now they're embracing it, from my perspective. Right. And I would just add that, look, there's so many, so many satellites at Norbit now, right? The space station has a methane emission or carbon emission sensor on it. Um, and so you'll see this gas leak from space, right? But the other key piece of the puzzle is, well, well who owns that asset? What happens there, right? And if you don't understand that, you're only answering half the problem, right? Mm -hmm. So combining top-down satellite imagery with this, this, this baseline physical asset level reference data together will provide a powerful climate risk solution for the financial sector. That's where right. we're headed. Mm -hmm. um, Jessica, any? Yeah, I don't know that, it, that it's particularly COVID related, but I think a comment that, you, that both of you guys made earlier of the waxing and waning, let's call it, focus on ESG from an asset management or, and let's call it an investor perspective in the U.S., right? I mean, I think that's been something that's going to be a huge deal in that alternative data space. Because when you look at the, I think, long-term megatrend, investors do care about ESG. Again, you can come debate me on that. Maybe they'll get sick of it. But I do think Europe tends to be long-term leading indicator for where our society does go. Um, for exceptions, but um, this feels like this slow, slow, slow train that's stopping and starting, stopping and starting, but still heading to the same location. And the main problem is actually being able to connect the data to say, is this company doing a quote unquote good job? Like we have these two issues, right? What do we want companies doing? We don't have really any way to get together on that. But even if you could pick a viewpoint, then are they doing it? And are, you know, we're going through wordsmithing when we think about how we want to talk to companies, micromanaging whether we want to say we we encourage or expect you to do something in the future, right? Um, well, how are we going to know whether we said we encouraged or expected a company to take whichever word we pick, a certain ESG action, it's got to be quantified. Um, and so I think that that ESG is going to be um, you know, not necessarily a COVID-driven concern, but I think ESG is going to be a very big um, use case for alternative data, the types of alternative data we've been talking about. And I think that you're going to see it becoming more and more and more important for investors to be able to actually um, show that not just I'm well-intended and here are impact investments that have the right intention, but that there are outcomes um, or that it's quantifiable how I'm allocating my investment dollars against um, environmental, let's call it. I think environmental is the main, you know, leg of that ESG stool where, where data has a, this type of data has a big role to play. Mm -hmm. I would just, right. just add to that, um, if you think about it, it probably should be CESG and add climate to the beginning. Yeah. So, you know, ESG is going to continue to live, but now we're going to start to drill down to a physical asset level, right? and understanding what's happening at that level with, with satellite telemetry and other fact-based regulatory data sources that live at the physical asset level is where ESG is headed. I, I think you're starting to see the big vendors pivoting away from corporate down to an asset level to get a better understanding of what's going on. Mm -hmm. uh, John, any thoughts on the, the COVID? Uh, I, I just <clears throat> I saw COVID as a huge accelerant for this, this process, uh, the whole alternative data space. Um, people were thirsting for information we were all sitting in our, our homes waiting for, you know, the company to say something 90 days later. And so there was a lot of interest in, you know, what's the consumer doing right now? How has it changed right now? That sort of thing. And, and so it, it, it uh, certainly uh, put a spotlight on alternative sources of information to inform what the heck's really going on in the world. And um, I think, you know, that, that showed people the value and, um, you know, you know, it's been a, it's been a continued kind of up and to the right since then too. Mm -hmm.